Are we ready? As always. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to uh, be here with you guys after right, a hard week stop. of learning. Uh, I was going to say actually a very complicated Pachy Yitzchak, but as I walked up the stairs, I decided to uh, do something a little more simpler. But it's not simple at all. So you will have to pay a little bit of attention, but it's not so uh, deep and profound in that sense. But believe that one day I'll give Sikhs, so we'll say over some uh, Pachy Yitzchaks. Bottom line is, in this week's parasha, we are introduced to one of our favorite mitzvahs, especially Arts and Mag's favorite mitzvah, the mitzvah of tshuva. <laughs> it's in this week's parasha. Right? <laughs> this mitzvah. Pat says, Line of place, it's not something wondrous, and it's not something distant, it's not something in the heavens, it's not something overseas. You don't have to travel, you don't have to make an arduous trip for it. No, where is it? It's innate, it is imminent, it is inside of you. You just got to make a decision. You don't got to go anywhere. You don't got to see no therapist. You don't got to sit with any rabbi for 10 hours and cry on his shoulders. You don't got none of that. It's just, it's just right there, right in you. You just got to make a decision. So, we, so I want to talk a little bit about tshuva because it, it is a parsha, and we are in Elo, so it really is quite seasonal. So we have here a Gemara in Avaita Zara. The Gemara in Avaita Zara tells us that there were two Averis that were done that would, should not have been done. David was not, it was, it was uncharacteristic that David should do that Avera. Uh, face value, it was like really uncharacteristic. I mean, basically, face value, it looks like he abducted his general's wife, and he basically raped her, and then he got the general bumped off to boot. That's what happened, right? He took a Bathsheba, and she got impregnated, and he wanted to make it hush-hush, somehow other getting, making believe that uh, she got preg pregnant from Uriachiti, that didn't work out, so basically he got, he got uh, Uriachiti snuffed, he got him killed. How did he do that? Oyechiti was fighting in the front lines, and he told, David Amalek sent to Yoav a message, when he's in the front lines, don't give him any support. Basically abandoned him in the front lines, and sure enough, he got killed, right? It don't sound too uh, tasteful, this type of story, to say, to say it in the least. Now, of course, we know, Gemara says anyone who David did a, the egregious, heinous sin is wrong, but there's no question he did a sin. That, that, that's not the issue. The question is just what level. The bottom line is, the Gemara says, David Amal should have not done that sin. It, it's uncharacteristic. It, it's something that shouldn't have happened. So why did it happen? Shouldn't have why it happened. The Gemara says, because in the future, in 2024 maybe, or some other year, someone's going to do a sin, and they'll say, oh, it's all hopeless. There's no hope for me. I am a sinner. God hates me. So, God, so, so, so we tell the guy, look at David. Look what happened with Dovin. And you know what? He's okay. He's still, he's still, the, uh, he's still the precursor, the, ant the antecessor, the predecessor of, of, of Mashiach. And he's still the king, Dovin Melchayim. So Dovin Melch failed big time. And he was able to get out of the, the rut. He was able to do you could too. So the only reason why Dovin did the sin was it for him to be a model for us. That when we sin, we shouldn't get depressed. That's what it says. Black and white. That's it. If you think it is bad, don't worry about it. David also did bad. And somehow, while you got out of it, you'll get out of it too. The Gemara says, there is no way in the world that Klai Yisrael should have done that Misa. Klai Yisrael should not have done the Eagle. I mean, that is analogous to cheating on your husband on the night of the wedding. That is not kosher. That is not nice. That is what happens, basically. Right? You get the Harsina, and they, they, they go, that's, that's what happened. And I'm making it up. That's, that's, a Mishle, that's the way the Pasuk, uh, the Pasuk says it openly, that, that the Klai soul was adulterous on the, night of the, on the wedding night. That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. You figure you're making it for the first week or something. You know? That's pretty bad. So the Gemara says that Yisrael should not have done that. It should not have happened. So why did it happen then? The same thing. Even the whole Seabird does a chik. In 2024, there's some Seabird that does a terrible chik. And they're like, oh, it's hopeless. It is hopeless. God hates us. We have no chance of return. No, no, listen. You're not worse than the, the story of the eagle. There's nothing, nothing more egregious than that. And God forgave them. 
and they went on, and they got, uh, they, they got atonement, they got absolved. You don't got to worry about it. So it says here, two chets, that shouldn't have happened, but it happened in order for it to teach us that we're not so hopeless as we think we are. David got out of his issues. He saw, uh, Klai Yisrael got out of their, their, their issues. We get out of it too. Right. So the Meshach Chachma asked, why is it that these two particularly are chosen? The chet of David HaMelech and the chet of, of, of Klai Yisrael with the eagle. Is there some other, uh, some other overtone that's being taught over here, that's being intimated over here? So, we start off. We all know the Gemara says, what is the quintessential tshuva? What is the best way to do tshuva, the acme of tshuva? So the Gemara says, quite vividly, Isa makim, Isa perek, Isa isha. So you went ahead, not you, but someone had a terrible adulterous affair or something to that sort. So he wants to do tshuva, he's feeling guilty. So the only way he could do real tshuva called tshuva samishko, if let's say, in a couple weeks from now, he's in the same situation, the same woman, she's wearing the same dress, and you are got the same exact place, and you're still in your height, and you still got your, your hormones running, and you don't do it. That is the, quintess, the quintessential tshuva, because you, you were in the same exact position, you didn't do it. Right? Well, let's say when you're 19 years old, you're running around with someone, <coughs> some, and then at 89 years old, you decide to do tshuva. <laughs> she probably don't look the same. You definitely don't look the same, right? You know, it's not, it's not, that's not, that's not going to work, right? It's not called tshuva samishkol. Yeah, you know, big deal. You're 89 years old now. Or let's say last week, never someone did a terrible adulterous sin in some uh, private place. And the next week, he, he really feels bad about it. He really feels bad about it. Uh, mm. But he meets a girl in shul. Ah, he's not going to do the sin in shul, right? You know, it, it's not, it's not going to happen here. So it's not, that's not true with a mishkel. It's got to be the same exact situation, right? So the truth is that's not so common. But that's, what you gotta, that's basically what you got to set up. If you want to prove to the world and to yourself and to God, seemingly you got to do a uh, tshuva tamishkel. Fine. Now, so let's see. David Amelch, did he do tshuva tamishkel or not? So, <coughs> there's, a, there's a lot of halachic things we got to go through, but not gonna, we, I'm going to sort of like brush over it. But basically, we all know that David Melech seemingly he was over on Aishas Ish, but we all know based on the Gemara that's not what happened. He was not, he actually legally married Bathsheba for that night. He actually, uh, he actually clandestinely married her that night. He wasn't even over on Znus. How is that? But she was married to Urichit. Because we all know that the soldiers of David Melech, when they went out to war, they would give a get to their wife. They would give a get to their wife. Why would they give the get to their wife? Just in case they don't come back. And he's MIA, missing in action. We don't know where he is. We don't want the wife to end up being an aguna. We don't want her to be forlorn and, and desolate, not, having any, not knowing where her husband is. So it was, uh, it was the methodology in, in David Mel's army. And by the way, the one, the, 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 they weren't thinking about doing this in, the Israeli, in, the, in recent years in the Israeli army, the same type of thing. To give a get and when they come back, they'll remarry, right? They'll come back, they'll remarry. So technically, Bathsheba was not a married woman when David took her. But still, so it's something called scouts on her. You know, come on. It's, you know, it's understood that you're not supposed to uh, take her. It's understood that bottom line is she is designated for Rechiti. But bottom line is, they were legally married. That's going to be the halakhic important, important point, that they were illegally married. So. What was the chet? The chet was chil Hashem. Bottom line is, there was a certain understanding in Klai Yisrael that you don't take a man's wife when he's at war. And you, David Amel, who was the king and the paragon of, uh, of, uh, uh, of righteousness, failed in that. So it was more of like a chil Hashem type of thing. It was more of a, uh, a subtle uh, midas type of thing. Not acting properly, but not, not real adultery. And that we see that openly because we all know the famous story. When Nathan Hanavi, when he <coughs> approaches Dovra Melech, when he, when he approaches uh, 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 Dovra Melech, what does he say to, what does he say to Dovra Melech when the story happens? So he comes in, Nathan Hanavi walks in uh, nonchalantly. He doesn't, walk, he, doesn't walk, he doesn't walk in very vindictive. He says, hey, David, I, I got to tell you, I have a story to tell you. I want to ask you about a certain story that happened. The David said, yeah, what was the story? There was this rich man. And he had lots and lots of sheep and cattle and chattel. He had it all. And his next door neighbor 
next door neighbor was poor. Poor has a revenue from Martha Mac. He was poor. <laughs> and he had all he had was one sheep and a little family. And that sheep was like their pet. And somehow or other, it gave solace to the family. And they really, uh, they really were delighted in that sheep. And the sheep would eat in their house. And they would eat from the sheep would eat on the table. And the sheep would, would the sheep was like was, was like part of the family. And one day, by Yahweh Halech Leish Usher, a so a sojourn, a, a a a traveler came to visit the rich man. And the rich man didn't want to use his own sheep, even though he had thousands of them. And the so, the Halech became was a guest. And the rich man decided to take that little sheep, that little sheep the next door, that little sheep next door, right? He took it. He stole it. And he gave it to the Ish Habar Elov. He gave it to the man that came to visit him. So already the Baal Musa already talked about, if you notice that, that, that guy is first called Halich, Orech, Ish. So basically, it, 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 it's referring to the Yitzhahara. The Yitzhahara refers to the Halich. He just comes in and says, you know, a little a traveler. But then he becomes a guest. But eventually he turns into a Ish. He turns into a man. I mean, he becomes he 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 becomes a a, a solid a part of a, a, of a person's life. But the way, so Tadama heard this story, how this rich man did what he did, and he went ballistic. And Tadama said, "What? Who is this rich guy? He deserves to die. Ben Mavasu. He deserves to die, and he should pay four and f he should pay four times the sheep, right? That's what he deserves." So Nelson, uh, Nelson said, "I got bad news, David. You're the guy. You're the guy. It's you." You're the one, poor Uri, your general, he had, one, uh, he had one wife, not like you had a bunch, and he took his wife, and he goes on and on, and what would me and you have done? We would have tried to justify, we would have said, nah, it wasn't my fault, I saw her bathing naked on the roof, what could I do, I'm a man, like, what do you want for my wife? And, you know, or we all know, we all know that the Madrashim say that David Melech knew he had to marry Bathsheba, and it was true, he had to marry Bathsheba, we all know the Madrash, David had all the, all the excuses in the world. What did David say? Chatasi. Right, just, he just said right away, he said, you got me, Chatasi. He, unlike Shoal, who tried to make some justifications, David was a man, said yes, Chatasi. He didn't try to make any, he, he didn't try to make any mitigations. Okay? But what, again, what do you see from here? Nothing, what, what do you see that Nassim uh, Hanavi said? If, he, if David was adulterous, he should have said, what, what is this Mashal? A guy stole the lamb. Those are all Ben Adam Le Those are all issues of Ben Adam Le Chaveri. Stealing lamb or stealing is Ben Adam Le If David Amalek was really adulterous, that's, that's, that's already Ben Adam Le That's a whole different ballgame, right? We see already from the way that Nathan Anavi is dealing with the situation, he wasn't dealing with it on the level of adultery. He was, divin, he was more dealing with it on the level of mor morals of Ben Adam Le Chaveri. So but this is well known. This is well known that David Amalek was, was not adulterous, and it's well known that he actually legally uh, married her. So, okay, David Melch says is, uh, is contrite. He wants to do tshuva. He wants to do penance. So what should he do? Clearly what he should do is very simple. Tshuva Tamishkal. What would be Tshuva Tamishkal? To get rid of Bathsheba. That's what he should do. He should divorce Bathsheba, right? That's like the first thing he should do. If you want to do Tshuva Tamishkal, so she's the object of your desire. She's where you failed. Uh, divorce her. And the truth is, he didn't do that. We, not only did he do that, he... He remained married to her. And not only that, he had a child named Shlomo HaMelech with her. So he did not divorce her. He remained married to her. Right? And we all know the story. She actually got impregnated that first time. But that child died. But then he remained with uh, uh, Bathsheba. And she is the mother of Shlomo HaMelech. Right? So the question is, why didn't David divorce her? Why didn't he divorce her? If you, if you have to choose a mishkov, that's the way to go. So that's what he should have done. He should divorce her. That would be the quintessence. That would be the, uh, the, the par that would be the, the acme of doing tshuva. The answer is very simple. Because you can't do tshuva on other people's cheshbainas. Right? You can't do tshuva if it's a, it's a hurt <coughs> detriment to anyone else. So it comes like this. We all know a king that legally, that's why it's important what I said before, a king that lived with someone legally, that woman cannot live with any other person ever. A, a king that ever li that lives, right? You can't wear you can't wear a king's clothes. You can't uh, you can't use a, anything that the king hoards. <laughs> you can't use anything of the king's, including that is a a, a king that lived with someone legally. That's it. N even if the king dies, even if the king divorces her, 
That's it. She can't live with anyone else ever. So it's also, yeah, yeah, it's also. So David was stuck. He wanted to divorce her. But if he would divorce her, she would be an aguda. She would be, she would be forlorn for the rest of her life. She couldn't marry anyone else. Because so by dint that David was the king and he legally did marry her, he couldn't do real tuba. Because the only way he could do real tuba is if he divorced her. But he couldn't do that because that would be on her expense. And you can't be from on other people. Expenses, right? Of course, we learn here. It can't be from other people's expenses. So he was, <laughs> he was really very stuck of it. And because of that, if you ever read Tehillim and he goes through it, David was, his whole life had this specter up on him. He always had this gloom about him that he felt, I cannot do tshuva. I, there's no way I can do tshuva the right way. I can't do tshuva ha- mishkal. Because I cannot, do, I cannot divorce Batsheva. So we do find, like for example, we have here in, um, in Tehillim Lamed Ches, he talks about Batsheva. He talks about Batsheva. And he says, I need Letzela nothing, right? <laughs> how, how do you refer to a woman always? Letzela, right? God took a rib from, from Adam. I need Letzela nothing. So basically he's referring to Batsheva, that nothing. I have to remain married to her because... That's the right thing to do. But, but because of that, I really have what people, you know, David Melech was uh, constantly uh, attacked by his uh, detractors, and they always attacked him about Batsheva. They always attacked him about Batsheva. That was a big thing. Hey, you have no self control, look at you. And they always attacked him. And he, and he basically said, I, I have nothing to answer back. Because if I got rid of her, I could say, look, I did tshuva. But he can't get rid of her. So this was always like an albatross. It was always something on him that he couldn't get rid of. Right? As it says there, can he sell a nachin? I got to sell a nachin, meaning I'm stuck. It's, it's a right marriage. But I can't answer back my, my detractors. Okay? So that's one uh, allusion to this, uh, to this uh, story. Now. We do find that David did try to do some type of tshuva. He tried to make it as close as possible. Where do we find that? So we find it in two stories. We all know David Melech had a son. At the end of life, he had a son named Avshalom. And Avshalom decided to rebel. Right? Funny enough, he decided to rebel. And, you know, they had some tension. It wasn't the best relationship. Avshalom and his father, to put it mildly. He rebelled. And in order to solidify his rebellion, he uh, basically took David Melech's wife's Ten Pelagshim. And he lived with them in open, I mean, not obviously openly, but everyone knew that he, uh, he took them. And his point was, his point was, I'm the king now. That was his point. It was to solidify his rebellion. We all know at the end of Shalom had an uh, unhappy demise. <coughs> but it says that David Amalek, I don't want to get about halachic issues here, but basically David Amalek was not allowed to live with those ten concubines anymore, for whatever reasons. But he would always used to dress them up nicely. And he would always be in their presence. And he would say, I'm not going to live with you. I'm not going to live with you. And, but I'm going to basically entice myself in the sense to bring about some type of desire. And I will not live with you. And that should be some type of kapara for my uh, misdemeanor or my sin that I did with Bathsheba. The same thing we find by Avishag. We know at the end of David's life, he was cold, and he had this beautiful woman named Avishag, who was basically, warmed him up, but it says there clearly, he never married her. He never touched her in that way. In a parochial way, he never touched her, and he oh, was there too, David Mouse said the same thing, I know I'm an old man, and I know this, and I know that, but I still have some strength in me, but I'm still not going to live with you, because I want to do tshuva about Sheva. The bottom line is, this is a midrashim, I'm just quoting a midrashim. The bottom line is, he tried. He did the best he can to reenact the situation with Bathsheba as much as possible, basically to be in a deep desire and not to uh, react on it. He tried, but bottom line is, he wasn't able to do the pure Jewish Hamishko that he would have liked to do. Like to do. Now, with this we understand a, a very interesting Tehillim. We say in Gimel, Mizmo David, a psalm for David, a praise for David, a song for David, when he ran away from Avshalom, his son. So already the Rishayna mess. When you, David, when he ran away from Avshalom, his son, he's singing a psalm? He's singing a song? A song of praise? Uh, a peon? He should be singing an, an elegy. It should be a kinna. 
It shouldn't be a song of happiness. What is this? Oh. But according to this, we have a little bit of a, a better understanding. Because we have to know something about David HaMelech's life. We have to know that many people felt that David HaMelech was illegally the king. That he never really was the king. If you know, there was a king before David HaMelech. Who was that? Shaul. And Shaul, David was Shaul's son-in-law. And the, 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 David was in Shaul's army. And you, Shaul was from which was Shavit Binyamin. And you can imagine when David took over, his, the Shavit Binyamin were not happy. They felt that this is, this, is, this is egregious, this is disrespectful, a son in law taking over, getting, and, 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 and basically, if you know the story, David basically uh, uh, killed out a lot of Shaul's family. It, it happened. He, he allowed it to happen. And actually, when David became king, he wasn't king right away over Eklai's soul. For seven years, he was only king <coughs> over Yushalayim, over Yehuda. Later on, after seven years later, when Shaul's son died, when Ish-Baishas when, um, when when died, when ish died, he became king over everyone. But there was always this renegade group basically Shea Binyamin, who did not accept David. And they felt he was always an imposter. Okay? So now. And there were many rebellions in David Amalek's life. There were many rebellions in David Amalek's life. Uh, basically, basically voicing this opinion. You, David Amalek, had no right to be king in the first place. So, it comes out like this. This is the first time that there's a rebellion of his own son. And there was a major support there was major, major support from all of Klai so that his son should take over. So, don't mess like this. It, it's a little bit of a, a, of a lumber. In the other rebellions, what were the other rebellions? Other rebellions were, you, David Amal, have no right to be king. You stole the kingdom from Shaul. You stole it from Benjamin. This is not right. I, I know we're in 2024, and, and in hindsight, it sounds crazy. David Amal, for sure he's king. But you have to understand, then, they didn't have email. They didn't know what's going on. They didn't know that Shmuel was told by God that David should be king. They had no idea. They're sure that David stole the kingdom. You know, we have hindsight. So we have, well, what do you mean? David's not king? Yeah. For most of his kingdom, most people said he was not, right, he was not rightfully to, he was not right to be the king. I mean, that's what it looks at, face value. That uh, Shaul's family should have taken over. The bottom line is, bottom line is, it comes out like this. If it's true, if there's a rebellion from detractors of David who are saying, like we had Sheva ben Bichri and others who rebelled against David, saying, you had no right to be the king in the first place. That means David had, it was a double sword. Because first of all, it means he shouldn't be king, and it means he should divorce Bathsheba. And he should do two with Hamishkel. Because the only reason why he couldn't divorce Bathsheba, because he's king. And since he's king, if he divorces Bathsheba, Bathsheba will uh, not be able to marry anyone else. So only if he's really the king, doesn't make sense that he couldn't do real tshuva, right? Because if I'm a king, I can't do real tshuva. But all the, uh, the if the rebellion is that you're not a king, so it comes out as a, a it's, it, it, it's a double insult. You're not a king, and you didn't do tshuva the right way. Because since you're not the king, you really should divorce Bathsheba. Because if you divorce Bathsheba, she can marry someone else. This rebellion, which is basically at the end of his life, he said, oh, they, what was the rebellion of Shalom? What, what, was, what was the rebellion? Avshalom said black and white. Yeah, David and Melech. Everyone said, yeah, David and Melech, you're the king. But you're like Biden. It's time for you to go. It's time for you to go. <laughs> That's what it was about. That, so no one denied the, the, no, one, no, one was, no one denied the fact that David and Melech was the king. He, no one denied it. On the contrary, they said, <coughs> Avshalom should be your successor. You're an old man. And it's time for you to go. Whatever. There was political reasons, political intrigues. But basically, that was the force of this rebellion. That was the force of the rebellion. The force of the rebellion was, you were the king, let your son take over. Okay? So that's why it's Mizmar and David. That's why David's saying at this rebellion. He said, at least at this rebellion, I don't got to feel guilty that I didn't divorce Bathsheba. All the other rebellions, when it happened, he felt guilty. Maybe I'm not really king or, or whatever. It, it, had the, it had the image that, oh, I'm not the king. So I didn't do tshuva. Why did I do tshuva? Because I didn't divorce Bathsheba. And I should have bought Bathsheba. Because why not? She can marry someone else. At this rebellion, there was a silver lining that he didn't have that guilt. 
it wasn't it, 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 it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't overlaid with his guilt that oh I should have divorced my seven because everyone agreed he should be the king. That's why it says there Mizmar. Uh, that's why it says there Mizmar Ledavid Bevarkani Avshalom Benai. I can read it into the words, but th- this is a message that we could read into the words. Fine. Now, <coughs> according to this, we have a better understanding of the conversation of sh- of. Uh, uh, first, we have a better understanding. The puzzle is openly. The puzzle is openly. Shev ben Bichi was another one of the, re- of the rebelli- uh, of, of rebellious uh, against David. And the puzzle is openly. Shev ben Bichi was not as bad as Avshalom. And everyone asked the question how could it be? Avshalom was a son. Your own son stabs you in the back? How could it be that Shev ben Bichi, who was from Sheva ben Yamin, his rebellion is considered more egregious than David Amalek? But that's the answer. Because at least if Avshalom did the rebellion, David Amal doesn't have to feel guilty that he didn't do the proper tshuva. But when Sheva ben Bichri did the part rebellion, Sheva ben Bichri is saying, you had no right to be king in the first place. So, so you have this, like, you have like this, uh, this, uh, this overtone of the story going on, of the story in the background, why didn't you divorce Bathsheba to do tshuva to Mishkol? Fine. We find a story by Sheva ben, we find a story by Shem ben Geri. Now, Shem ben Geri was an old, old, old Rosh Hashiva. He was a big Tama Chacham. And he was a big supporter of Shul because he was from Binyamin. He, he couldn't, he detested David. He could not stand David Amalek. He was sure, he was sure that David was a, a, a rascal and he stole the kingdom from Shaul. And we find the Navi, so, so, so Shem ben Geir personally didn't like Sh- David, didn't like Avshal, didn't like anyone. He personally didn't like anyone. We find, we find the story when, when David Amalek is running away from Avshal, Shem ben Geir appears and he lets David have it. Shem ben Geir says, he starts cursing him out. He says, Ish Dumim, you're a murderer. Ish Blial, you're a lowlife and a miscreant, is what Shimon Geira says. Because remember, Shaul's whole family got killed. Not directly by David, but whatever. He got, they got killed. So he was like really upset. And he says, you're des- You deserve what you're getting. You deserve what you're getting. So again, Shimon Geira wasn't supporting Afshalm so much. He didn't like Afshalm either. He didn't like any of them. But he was so happy that David, at, was, was, he felt he was getting his just desserts. And you're, so after all that, he says, and you know what, something else? You're a lousy person to boot. That's what he tells David. So after he calls him a murderer, a miscreant, and any other uh, nice word you want to speak out, he, he adds, And the Medrash says, the Medrash says, he's referring to the story about Sheva. He always liked to dig in about Sheva. And the dig is this. He, that was his dig. You didn't do Sheva, David, because you're not a king. You ain't no king, David. So you didn't do no Sheva because you had to get rid of her. Okay, that's the story of Shem ben Geira. Now, what happens? If you know the sad story of Avshalom, he didn't make it. He, his rebellion did not work out too well, and it should have worked out well, but he took bad advice. He didn't take the uh, Achitofel's advice, and at the end, Dov, he got killed, and, and David got back to Yushalayim. This is what right? That was like 54, <coughs> 55. And who comes in to the scene? Shem ben Geira. And he comes... Basically groveling. He comes groveling. So, so David, ah, you know I didn't mean what I said. You know I didn't. I called you murderer, miscreant, scra- uh, scoundrel. Ah, come on, David. Right? That's what he says. So he comes, he comes out. I'm not El Melech. I'll actually. So Shimmy coming out. Because Shimmy knows he's a dead man. Shimmy knows he is a dead man. Because David is back on his throne. And Shimmy cursed him out a couple of weeks ago and called him every name in the book, right? E- Every, epit- every invective that's possible, he called them, right? Every epithet possible, he called them. So what happens? He comes back to David. He says like this. Eh, I'll be oven. I'll just, don't remember what I said to you. Look, then he says there, when you're running away, the simple means, eh, don't take it to your heart, Melech. Don't take it to your heart. That, 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 that's simply what the Pasuk means. But the Meshach Chachma explains, he's, in, he, he's, he's telling him something. He's telling him like this. He's, tell, he, 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 he's intimating something to, to David. He says, listen, David, I want you to know I'm really doing tshuva now. I really realize that I was wrong. So everyone's going to say, yeah, sure, Shimmy. Yeah, sure. yeah, your head's on the line. So of course, now all of a sudden, the, all of a sudden you decide that you're, you're doing tshuva. What are you going to say? You're not going to do tshuva? You're, you're not really doing tshuva. You want to save yourself. So Shimmy says, no. I'm really doing tshuva. So Shimmy says, but I, you're right, I can't prove it. Of course, now I have no choice. 
But he said, L'shum ha-melech alibayin. You too, in your calculation, David, in your calculation, me and you are in the same predicament. You also couldn't do tshuva. Because you were a melech. And since you're a melech, you couldn't divorce Bacheva. So you also could never really do tshuva. So me too, said Shimbegeri, Shimbegera, I'm telling you, David, I promise you're doing real tshuva. I, I can't prove it now. How can I prove it now? <laughs> I have no choice. Obviously, you, <laughs> if, if I don't do tshuva now, you'll kill me. But you should know, I really mean it. So Shum HaMelech el just like you, David, because you're king, the only tshuva that you could do within your heart, you couldn't do the real you can't, you couldn't b- b- manifest the real tshuva, which is tshuva mishkol. You could not do it. I'm also in the same predicament. And you know what? David took it. David, David said, okay, you're, well, let you live. David, David liked that argument and said, you know what, Shimmy? You're right. Maybe you are doing real tshuva, and I can't prove that you're not. And you can't prove that you're doing real tshuva. You, you're in the same predicament I am, that you can't do tshuva mishkol. He let him go. But he got him later on. Don't worry about it. He got him later on. So later on, he'd get bumps off. But he, later on. But bottom line is, also in that story, Shimon Geras says, he mentions base Yosef. What he means here is, he's saying, I know him from Yosef and Benjamin. That's what, and I, he's, he, he's making a reference that he should be on Shoal's side, but no. But the Medrash says that Shimon Megair was saying, and there was another time in history this happened, by Yosef. <laughs> so the brothers told Yosef, and lo and behold, when Yosef said, hey, I, when Yosef revealed himself, they started feeling a little bit contrite. Duh. Okay, okay, now you feel contrite after Yosef reveals himself to be the king and he basically be feeding you for the last couple of years and the only way you're going to survive is if you recognize him to be the king. So all of a sudden the brothers did tshuva. But that, was that a tshuva to Mishkal? Of course not. How could that be tshuva to Mishkal? You know, what, 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 <laughs> how could they reenact the story of taking some helpless a person and throw him in a pit and say, no, we're not going to tell him about that and we'll take him out. They couldn't react the situation. They couldn't reenact the story, right? It was not, it's not possible. So Shimon Gera also makes a reference to, to Yosef. Yosef also, Yosef's brothers also had the same problem. So me, David, Yosef, we all got the same problem that we cannot do a, a Chuvis Ha Mishko. So you'll, okay? A, so bottom line is, the bottom line is that we find the Gemara that there's a whole machloikis if you should do, if you do a tshuva on an Avera. Should you do tshuva next year, and the next year, and the next year, right? Therapists will say no, leave it alone, right? But the Gemara, according to one sheet, uh, that no, you do an Avera, you keep on doing tshuva, it doesn't make a difference. <coughs> so, seemingly we have a riot from David Amel. Dunmel says, Pishi ani eda the chatosi negdi tamid. So David Dunmel says that he's always doing tshuva about tshuva. Always, 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 always. Always. But now we understand why. Maybe if you do a real 100% tshuva, tshuva tamishko, you don't, that's it. Last Tuesday, you did something wrong. The same as that thing comes up next Tuesday, you don't do it. That's it. You do tshuva once, that's it. But David, since he could never really do the 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 the, par- the the epitome of tshuva he can never do the acme of tshuva the um, the, uh, the, the 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 most pinnacle type of tshuva so therefore he had to do charat all the time he had to do vidu all the time okay now there was someone else in history another story in history where it was impossible to do a full tshuva who is that by the eagle so what happened over there Moshe Rabbeinu goes up he's not there for forty days. And the uh, Sutton shows him uh, a bed of Moshe. Uh, Moshe's dead and he's floating up in the clouds. So that's obviously allegorical. It obviously means that they said that Moshe was, Moshe's, Moshe, everything was a semantic trick. Moshe, all this Kriyas <coughs> Yamsuf. The, the, the public says there, Kizem Moshe Ish. Oh, Moshe was just a man. And I don't know how he pulled the wool out of his eyes, but obviously he's one trick, you know, like Houdini. There's one trick that he didn't make it. You know, there's one trick that he didn't make it. And that's it. Moshe's gone, and we're finished, and we're sitting ducks in the desert. It's over. So that's what they said, right? So that's what, that was the, that, that was, that, that's the, that's the uh, metaphor they saw of Moshe floating in the sky, dead. It's a metaphor. So bottom line is, Moshe comes down and says, you guys made a big mistake, <laughs> right? He comes down, and he ain't a happy camper, right? So... The, the, Klai Yisrael tries to do tshuva. Could they ever do real tshuva again? 
So the answer is obviously not. Now, it is true Choice, uh, Moshe tried his best to reenact the same situation again. How did he do it? He went up again for 40 days. But you got to be pretty stupid to make the same mistake twice, right? You know, you know, you got to be pretty dumb, you know, to do the same mistake twice. So even though he tried to re to, re to reenact the same situation that he went up again forty days, but obviously they weren't going to make the same mistake twice. Obviously, it, so isn't that, he, well, isn't that every single type of tshuva? Sure. No, you got to. I mean, every single thing you can say we got to stupid. Tshuva. No, but the mistake. What? What was the mistake? The first time yeah, he's yeah. not coming back. He's not coming back. He's dead. So what, do you think again that's going to happen again the second time? Because he was sick. The second time he also said 40 days. So, I mean, I would agree. I don't know why. I don't know why. Why, didn't he, why couldn't he say the second time I'm going to come back 40 days and then he shouldn't come back for like another 345 days or something? You know, come back like really late. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. He came back. He came the same six hours late. It was the same six hours. So, you know, well, right, something like that. So bottom line is, so yeah, no. So you, uh, I don't know about you, but yeah, you could do a very with a beautiful one on Sunday, and next Sunday you want to do it again. That's the way it is. That's the way we are built, right? You just want to do it exactly. As you want to do it again. So yeah, there you could do two of the Mishkal. On Sunday you did it. Next Sunday you're not gonna do it, even though you have exactly the same situation, the same place, the same tryst, every, everything the same, everything exactly the same. But over here it's impossible. It's impossible that they're gonna fail again. I mean, unless they're retarded, right? It's impossible. So, so, but he tried. He tried to reenact as much as possible, but he went up again for 40 days, but obviously they weren't going to fail again this time. Obviously. So now, so now we get to the punchline. Now we get to the punchline. Now we understand the Gemara, what the Gemara is, is why it refers to these two sins. The Gemara says that there were two people who should not have done sins, or two entities, David and Israel. David was the story about Cheva, and Klai was the story of the eagle. And so Gemara says, why? So why, yes? Because he wanted to give a lesson to the, to, 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 to the future generations. Don't worry. Even David and uh, messed up pretty badly, but he, he was able to do tshuva. You could do tshuva too. Don't worry. Seber, if a whole Seber makes a mistake, Clyde is all messed up and pretty badly, and they're still around. Everything is okay. You could do tshuva. But now it's saying there's a, a, there is a undertone here. There's some type of... It, 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 it picks these two Averis because these two Averis are Averis that they could not fix. So here you are in 2023, I don't know, who knows how many Averis you've done, and there is no way you're going to be fixing them. There's no way you're going to be able to reenact the situation. Whatever it is, it's just impossible. Whatever the situation is, it's impossible to reenact it. Like, like most, most cases that way, many cases that way, you just cannot reenact it. You say it's over with, finished, done, God hates me, it's over with. I might as well just throw away the keeper and live right. Forget about it. It's over with. They say no. David is the same situation as you. He did a error that he could not rectify 100 percent. He could not rectify it 100 percent. It was impossible. And he, so that's why he picked. That's why the Gemara picks these examples because these are examples of errors that they could not rectify. They were not able to do the pure the tshuva of tshuva the the story of David and the story of Claudius Stroll by the eagle. So it's not happenstance that these are the two Averis that are picked. So no matter how helpless and hopeless and forlorn we, we feel, and we feel it's all over with, don't worry. There's always hope, like we see from David and uh, uh, Clyde. So no matter how egregious their sin was, they were able to rectify it to the extent that they're able to, and that's good enough. And that's what we say in the, um, in the famous Haftarah, Shuva Yisrael at Hashem Alekecha, Kikashalta Bavanecha, so, what, what is being uh, hinted to over here? Shuvi Yisrael, Ad Hashem Alkecha. Ki kashaltam v'necha. What do you mean, ki kashaltam v'necha? You've stumbled in your sin, obviously. Ki kashaltam v'necha is referring to this. You did a sin that you really stumbled in. You did a sin that you cannot fix anymore. You did a sin that you can't reenact the situation and, 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 and triumph. Like, like David's story and, and, and Klai Yisrael's story with Egel. That's it. Ki kashaltam v'necha. You did a real doozy of a sin. You can't undo it. Impossible. You know, uh, you know let's say you kill someone because you hate it. So, so next week you're not going to kill someone that you don't hate? I mean, what, what, what are you going to do? You can't, it's, it's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't undo it. You can't undo it, and you can't reenact it. It's just not possible. So what, what, what's, what are you going to do? You're right. There is no tshuva that you can manifest fully in this world. You, can't, you, can't, you cannot manifest tshuva in this world. But, but God knows that if you could reenact the story, your day of Telum was made. God knows that 
practically, empirically, you can't reenact it. But God knows, and he's the only one who knows, that if it was able to happen again, you wouldn't feel. So, Shuvi so Ad Hashem Alekecha, Ki Keshatam Alekecha. Right? Chui Machen Dvar, Veshuv El Hashem. Take words, that's all you can take. All you can take is words, that's all you could do, but that's good enough. It's, it's good enough, like we see from David, and like we see from Klai Yisrael. So the message is, it's never hopeless. He carved Alecha, Bepicha, Ubevavcha, like it says, He carved Alecha, Dabamai, Bepicha, Lacha, 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 Lacha,